Welcome, everyone. I'm Tom Lawrence. I have once again been granted the honor of leading and emceeing the last Oleo. I'm going to begin, as I always do, with a paraphrase of the American prayer. Door monitors, is everybody in? Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. Have you had a good festival? We've heard about life and death, legends and lies, folk tales and family, humor and hauntings. Has it been enough to base a story on? Welcome to the final oleo of the 10 year anniversary of the Georgia Mountain Storytelling Festival. <clears throat> this is not the me show, so let me take care of some housekeeping and get out of the way. Georgia Mountain Storytelling Festival is a 501c3 organization, charitable registered in the state of Georgia. It is grant dependent and volunteer led. Everybody that you see staffing that is not a performer is a volunteer. We all do this because we love stories and it is important to our mission to bring stories to an underrepresented area. This is a Title I district. More than half the people in these mountains live below the poverty line, and they don't have access to art like this unless we bring it. So that's why we do it. So take a moment. We are live streaming. Wave to the people at home. <laughs> Give a round of applause to all the volunteers. <clears throat> including our very talented ASL interpreters, Courtney and Cameron, who's on stage with me tonight. <clears throat> if you look in your program, if you look on the back of the festival shirts, you'll see that there are so many community ads. That is not because they bought advertising space. That is because they supported the festival in its entirety. That shows us that the community wants us here that shows us that the community desires what we have created. And 10 years is a good track record in a small area like this. <laughs> if you check in your program, there's also on one of the pages a very fancy QR code at the bottom. That is to give us comments and feedback. If you would rather not do that, we've got paper cards. They're located near the exits. We take that seriously. We want to be getting better. The main comment we got last year in this new space was, we can't see the storytellers. Can you have a stage? So we do listen, and we do value that feedback. Let us know what we can do better. You are our customer. You are our people. You are our family. All right. Last thing before we move on is I want to talk about our regional tellers that were just in our showcase and the people that did the children's stories and the people that ran the open mic and the people that did the workshops. These are your local people. If you have a school or a library or a private event that you want stories, contact the festival. We'll put you in touch with all these talented artists. We only bring the best here and you've seen them. So thank you and please support your local storytellers. Mm -hmm. Moving right along, I was fortunate enough to teach a workshop this morning on rhythm and tone and using that in storytelling. Thank you both of you who came to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I said in there, this class can be very, very brief. It can be 30 seconds long. Go watch Len Cabral. Thank you. Have a good morning. Len has a richness to his voice and a cadence to his telling. When you are in the midst of one of his stories, you are in good hands and you are being cared for. Len Cabral is brought to us by support from the Georgia Council for the Arts, Nora Roberts Foundation, and a kind donation from my family. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Len Cabral. <clears throat> Take 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the volunteers. What a wonderful festival you have here in your community. Take good care of it. This story I'm about to tell you comes from the island of Martinique. And it goes like this. Listen if you want to understand how a woman who had already run out of luck gave birth to her 14th daughter thus complicating the impossible task of feeding her family from an empty cupboard. In an attempt to get rid of her youngest without God noticing, she would send her off to the deep, dangerous forest for things that were useless and, above all, not to be found. One day, she sent her into the woods for a pound of butter. Without any back talk, the little girl set off to look where everyone would look in the woods for a pound of butter. Walking and daydreaming, she soon found she lost her way and could not find it behind her, in front of her, or on either side. Soon she came across an old woman sitting in the way that old people sit, beneath a tall fern. Mama, I'm lost. The old woman, sweet as honey, led her into her woodland hut, a hut made of bones, straw, and feathers of white birds. The roof was of coconut husk, held together with a spittle from webless spiders. This was most definitely the home of an Obear woman, which some of you might know as a witch. But this little girl didn't know anything about that, for what she didn't know was way more than what she did. Inside the gloomy hut, the unwavering flame of a candle illuminated a rocking chair, which the old lady sat herself down into with a creak, creak, creak. And the little girl murmured, Mama, I'm hungry. And the old crone replied with a voice made thick with flaccid gums. And me, it's thirsty I am, always thirsty. Go fetch me some water, and I'll give you all the food you want. Well, the little girl grabbed a calabash and went down to a nearby spring and came back with a calabash full of water, which the old woman threw down her gullet in one gulp. <laughs> More! Well, one trip led to another and another. In calabash after calabash, the girl dragged back. The old woman threw it down as if her throat was south of a burning desert. Mama, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Well, my darling... You find out my name, and I'll give you all the food you want, and I'll give you a pound of butter, and I'll even show you a way home. But first things first, find out my name. And by disappearing, she made herself invisible. The little girl sat in that hut as a candle flame flickered, causing shadows to dance on the wall like lace curtains blowing in the wind. And soon that candle sputtered out its last glimmer, and the room fell into complete darkness. And the little girl started to cry with such distress that a big, big, big serpent no, not a snakeling, but a nice, thick, fat snake slid across the floor as if it were a pet dog and even rubbed its head against her legs to reassure her, which wouldn't have reassured me in the least, but alas, I'm no longer a child. Some of the creatures in the forest know her name. Go ask them. Though it was after midnight, the little girl went out into the forest, and under a cathedral of bamboo, she asked 22,000 rats if they knew the old lady's name. Not one of them could tell her the old lady's name. She looked on the, on, she looked on the velvety underside of leaves and asked the lizards if they knew the old lady's name. They had to confess they did not know the old lady's name. She climbed a custard apple tree and asked the possum, who only looked up from its nocturnal feasting, to admit its ignorance of the old lady's name. And down by the backwater marsh, she asked the he toads and she toads if they knew the old lady's name. They did not even stop in their acrobatic amours to croak out their ignorance of the old lady's name. And since we're going into detail here, neither did the horseflies, the wood ants, the stink bugs, the nene bugs, the noisy hummingbirds, or the fat caterpillars knew the old lady's name. Well, soon the girl grew tired as it shut down by a, by a little creek. 
Now in these days, crab lived in these refreshing spots with their seven crab wives, their prodigy of crab children, their inexhaustible swarming of crab cousins, godchildren, and godparents. And the crabs, huh, they were something in those days because at the end of their long necks, they had pert little heads topped with cunning little flat brim boaters with egg-shaped crowns. Oh, they were something in those days, the crabs. And because their straw hats did not cover their ears, they heard all the grapevine gossip, the rancid rumors, the malicious hearsay, the tittle-tattle, the yakety-yak, all the dirt dished out at funerals, and just plain rubbish. <laughs> and since you may have easily gotten lost with all that jabber, when she asked the crabs if they knew the old lady's name, they all called out in unison, Madam Killiman, Bradyman, Killiman, Madam Killiman, Bradyman, Killiman, as they dance in capers around the spring. Now, the thing with the crabs, despite their long necks and their flat brim boaters and their egg shaped crowns, they had more claws and smarts. They had more claws and smarts, and even, and even less in brains. And when she asked them for something to eat or some encouraging words, it just some, some, some encouraging words, all they said was, Madam Killiman, Bradyman, Killiman, Madam Killiman, Brady. She Soon she grew tired of this and went back to the hut. And at the crack of dawn, the old lady appeared, adding the creaking of her bones to the creaking of the rocking chair. Creak, creak. Well, my darling, do you know my name? Yes, I know your name. Good. Because if you don't say my name, I'm going to eat you on the spot. What a fright. The little girl lost her memory. She said, uh, Streganona, uh, uh, Moesha, uh, uh, Streganona, Moesha, uh, Baba Yaga. Names such as that to the sinister amusement of the old lady who no, lo no longer bothered to conceal her true nature as a parasitic vine grew up through her hair. Her teeth became big and yellow as cows. Her nails became claws. Her feet how do you like this? Now display the clothing sheath of shining gray horn, which storytellers given to exaggeration call hoofs. <laughs> and she was just about to come off that chair to devour that little girl when the little girl called out at dizzying speed, Madam Killiman, Bradyman, Killiman, Madam Kill. And the old lady started to spin like a top, tiny flames jiggling out all over her body. You've beaten me, you've beaten me. She pulled a fistful of her hair out of her head. She beat her right breast over her heart. She had one, but on the wrong side. <laughs> she, she said, you can have my house and everything that's in it and all the food you want. And the little girl started to eat. <laughs> Eating's not the word for it. And Madam Killiman, Bradyman, Killiman, yes, she, the old bear woman of vices and saucy sorcery, the chamber pot crony of more than one old zombie, the bat king's bedfellow and the buff, practically chief head cook in hell's kitchen. She grabbed her cutlass with its blade of misfortune, honed sharp on the grindstone of disaster, and she set out in the early dawn light. And at her outraged approach, the creatures scattered so briefly that she did not come across the shadow, not even the shadow of an ant, until she came across the savannah, which is her prize, a three-horned bull named Biff. And without court of justice or attorney at law, she lit into Biff. She said, hey, you, Biff, you're the one who knows my name, and you're the one who told everybody my name is Madam Killiman Brady. My no, 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 it wasn't me. I swear it wasn't me. She looked him up and down as he shook his shivers. And just to be mean, she ripped off one of his horns. And ever since that day, bulls have two. And then she crossed over the next savannah, where she surprised a five-legged mule named Miles. And without court of justice or attorney at law, she lit into Miles. Hey, you, Miles, you're the one who knows my name, and you're the one who told everybody my name was Madam Kellyman, Bradyman Kelly. No, no, it wasn't me. I swear it wasn't me. And just to repay his innocence with malice, she ripped off one of his legs. And ever since that day, mules have four. And then she came down by the, by the creek where the crabs lived with their seven crab wives, their prodigy of crab children, their inexhaustible swarm of crab cousins, godchildren, and godparents. And some of the she crabs is just getting ready to give birth to a whole swarm and clutch of crablets. 
and some are just about to go get the midwife. <laughs> when Madam Killiman, Brady Man, Killiman, as was her want, she lit into the crab. She said, hey, you crabs, you're the one who knows my name, and you're the one who told everybody my name was Madam Killiman. But before she could finish, the crab, so incensed at this show of disrespect, yelled back at her and let the spittle fly. That's right, you old hag, you roly-poly, bat-faced set of toothless gums. We're the ones who know your name, and we're the ones who told everybody your name was Madam Killiman, Brady Man, Killiman, Madam Killiman, Brady Man, as they dance in capers around the spring. Now, this gave Madam Killiman fits of furry rage that kind of smooths out your skin by making it all puffy, but leaves you with white hair. She raised that cutlass with his bladed misfortune and came down with the flat side. Thwack! On the jolly crabs. Oh, shed a tear. <laughs> that cut their song short. Their long necks and their flat brim boaters were squished all the way down, and their regal heads, once held on so high, were squished into whatever was left. But despite this devastation, they continue to call out in broad daylight Madame Killiman's name. And their voices echo through the underbrush, clambered up the evergreen phyllo trees, where it launched itself off to an endless ferment of ears, room among his tattletales, and those detestable souls it write and rewrite stories. <laughs> and Madame Killiman knew her name is going to be so well known that she would never again be able to force lost travelers to bring, them, bring her water by subjecting them to that hoary riddle. And somewhere deep inside her, too much self-pity got mixed up with too much ego and too much gassy wrath. <laughs> and in a hot, warm, spectacular fashion, she tripped and she hit the ground so hard that it opened up like a well-thumbed book of suffering and slammed shut on her like a Bible of faith. And that place on earth became so unwholesome. It's where poison ivy, poison sumac, and poison oak got its start. <laughs> and just at that moment, the charm surrounding that house exploded, and the light they gave off was something marvelous to see. And everything was made beautiful. There were rows upon rows of blue breadfruit trees, and there were patches of everlasting yams, and the house was made beautiful with wood only grown in Guyana. And everything was made beautiful. And the girl, she lives there still with that snake who became quite a fine fellow. <laughs> and everybody is welcome to their place after a story time like this. They all go there and they hold up a glass in honor of the lovely lady of the house. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, dear. <laughs> I can only say it one more time. <laughs> Thank you, Len. I have to ask a question. Do you need a minute? Amanda and Ruth were talking about our next storyteller. We've got to bring Ann Rutherford. We really need to bring Ann Rutherford. We need to bring Ann Rutherford. And I was thinking, who? I don't know who this is. So I saw her at National, and she told a really wonderful story about a politically motivated chicken who had its own uniform and quite a following. And I thought, this lady is a complete kook. She'll fit right in. <laughs> when can we get her? Well, the answer is now. Ann Rutherford comes to us, with, sponsored by the Georgia Council for the Arts, and a generous gift from Canute and Kathy Rary. Please welcome back to the stage, Ann Rutherford.
Oh, it is a pure pleasure to be with you. And the festival committee, it does indeed take such good care of us, including having unlimited coffee available. <laughs> Nestor and I, were, we were talking about how important coffee is to our art. <laughs> and I, yeah, I'm from Portland, Oregon. We run on coffee in Portland, Oregon. It rains, it rains, it rains, it rains, it rains. And even though at my age I have had to switch to decaf, I still need my cup of coffee especially when it is the 32nd day of February. And it has been raining for 68 out of those 32 days. And I am doing yet one more errand in the rain and I remember that I should have replaced my windshield wipers so long ago. And I just, I need a cup of coffee. I need somebody to make me a cup of coffee. And then through that blurry windshield, I see the sign, that green sign <laughs> with the mermaid. You know the one I mean? And it's like she's a siren. Like not the woo, 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 but you know, like the siren that calls to ships that are tossing out at sea. She says, I have what you need. I have what you need. So I park the car and I go in, open the door and I get hit with that smell, that acrid, burned coffee smell. <laughs> it's the smell of suffering. <sighs> and I know it's gonna be good because I was raised Catholic. And I know you have to suffer for it to be really good. And the shop is full of people, all hip, together looking people who all look vaguely distraught, like they have a secret sorrow and a coffee drink in front of them. <laughs> and I want to be like one of those people. I need a coffee drink. So I get in line by the mugs but they're not mugs. The light hits them and they're ebony and ivory, and silver and gold. They're like chalices. They're like the grail. And I want one. I want to be somebody who drinks her coffee out of this kind of vessel. $38? But aren't I worth it? <laughs> Hi, yes, I'd like a coffee drink in this, please. You'd like a personal coffee drink, ma'am? Yes, that's what I want. A personal coffee drink. Because I am unique. I am special. And I'd like my own personal coffee drink. And what kind of drink would that be, ma'am? Oh, um, yeah, uh, drink, um, cappuccino, that's my uh, latte, that's wimpy. Uh, uh, oh, 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 macchiato, yeah, caramel. No. Caramel. <laughs> A caramel macchiato, that's what I want. Because that's what I'd be drinking on the veranda of my villa in Tuscany as I sit with the sun slipping down the golden Italian hills, and I sip caramel macchiato across from my sullen but sultry Italian lover. <laughs> and what size would you like, ma'am? Size. Oh, coffee. Um. I'd like, uh, what, what are my choice? You have like, uh, what, is grande? Is that the biggest one, grande? No, it's, it's venti, right? That's the biggest one, venti. Venti. <laughs> venti, venti, venti. Because I live life large. I walk on the grand stage. And I want a personal venti caramel macchiato and make it extra hot.
Would you like any pastry with that, ma'am? No, just the drink. Just give me the drink. Can I get a name for that, ma'am? Yes, um, Anastasia. <laughs> okay, Anastasia, that'll be $53.25. Fine, take it. Take all my money. I don't care. Just give me the drink. All right, I got a personal venti caramel macchiato for Anastasia, extra hot. Okay, personal venti caramel macchiato, Anastasia, extra hot. Personal vente caramel macchiato for Anastasia, extra hot. <gasps> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. that decaf. <laughs> and Rutherford. <laughs> <laughs> Our next storyteller, Mr. Gomez, we've heard so much this weekend about what he has done. Coming to the country undocumented, learning English, telling stories to overcome his stutter, winning so many moth events. Let's take a moment to shift gears and talk about what he is doing. What Nestor is doing is building bridges. He's creating connections. He's healing wounds. He's making friends. Please welcome our new friend back to the stage, Nestor Gomez. What I'm not doing is growing up. First of all, thank you so much for having me at this festival. It's been an honor and an extreme pleasure. Um, it's been amazing meeting so many new people. Uh, it's been an honor to share the story with each and every one of the storytellers. And this young lady is doing an amazing job. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> when I first came to this country, I realized that things were different. People were taller than me, spoke a different language than me, and even, even the traditions were different than the way that I was used to celebrate traditions and celebrate holidays. For example, you guys open your presents on Christmas morning, the morning after Christmas, the morning of Christmas. We open our presents at midnight the night before, so by the time you guys are just finding out what you have, we're already at the store changing what we got in case we don't like it. <laughs> you guys celebrate here Easter, which is something to do with a bunny that lays eggs that are made of chocolate and somehow had something to do with Christianity, I still don't get it. <laughs> but there was one holiday that I could not wrap my mind around. This was Halloween. See, in Guatemala, in Latin America, we celebrate El Dia de los Muertos. We go to the, to the cemetery and we put flowers on the tombs of the, of the people 
our beloved that have passed away. Uh, you guys celebrate differently. See, my family, my parents spent my whole life telling me not to take things from strangers and not to go to strangers' houses. <laughs> Here, you dress your kids, your kids up, you take them to strangers' houses, and they get stuff from strangers. And to make things more difficult, everybody's wearing a mask. In Guatemala, if you see anybody wearing a mask, you better run. Because they're going to rob you, kidnap you, or worse. So I couldn't understand Halloween for many, many years. And I didn't celebrate Halloween for many years. It wasn't until a few years ago, after I had spent many years here in the United States, that I realized I should start celebrating this holiday as well. But I don't know if you heard something about me. I'm cheap. I don't like to spend money. So I wasn't going to go to a store to buy a $300 outfit or a $500 outfit so I could disguise myself. It's too much money for me. So instead, I decided to go to my favorite store, the thrift stores. And I went to several thrift stores until I got everything that I needed for my costume. I needed white Converse, a black pair of pants, a white T-shirt with black stripes across, a black jacket, and a little French hat. I had my costume together, and I had spent $20, which was a lot of money for me, because I'm cheap. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to get my money back by going to a, to a contest and win the contest and get my money back. So I went to a, a nightclub downtown Chicago, and I paid $10 for parking, ouch, and $10 to get in, ouch, that's already $40 down. And I went to the contest, and the MC was calling Superman, Spider-Man. People were applauding, and he called me, and he's like, who are you supposed to be? And he's like, oh, I know, I know, you are a mind. A what, I say? A mind. One of those people that can talk and are, 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 are like in a glass. I'm like, no, I'm talking to you right now. I'm not a mind. <laughs> so who are you supposed to be, he say? I'm say, I'm Chompiras. And I can see by your expression that you don't know who Chompiras is. <laughs> so let me explain it to you. Chompiras is one of the characters from Chespirito. Yeah, you don't know who Chespirito is. Chespirito is one of the most, Mexi most famous Mexican comedians ever. He has so many characters and was so talented that Charlie Chaplin nicknamed him Chespirito, which means little Shakespeare. Every little kid in Mexico, in Guatemala, in Argentina, in Chile, in Peru, even in Brazil where they don't speak Spanish, we grew up watching Chespirito, watching Chompiras. But here, nobody saw Chompiras, nobody saw Chespirito. So believe it or not, I didn't win any money that night. <laughs> so I went back home, and I'm like, I already lost $40. I had to make my money back because I'm cheap. Um, so I decided the next day I'm going to go to another nightclub to try to make my money back. So I go to another nightclub, and they charge me $10 for parking, $50 down. And I try to get into the nightclub. The security guard say, you cannot come in here because you're wearing a hat. And I say, what? I say, you're wearing a hat. You cannot wear here because you cannot come in because gang bangers start fights because they wear hats. And you're wearing a hat. You cannot. I'm like, this has nothing to do with gang banging. This is for my costume. He's like, you cannot come in here. So I start to have an argument with him, I'm not going to fight him because um, I don't want to hurt him. <laughs> so he calls another security guard, and the security guard comes in and he's like, oh, the hat? That has, it's, it's, it's part of the costume, go in. And I look at the other security guard, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, go in, go in, guy. Go, go in, dude, go in. I go in, and I know why he let me in. As soon as I go in, they play in cumbia. They playing salsa, they playing merengue, they playing bachata. It's Latino night at the nightclub, and everybody knows who I am. <laughs> Guys are buying me drinks. Girls are taking pictures with me. That never happened to me before. The MC called Superman to the stage, called Spider-Man. He calls me. He didn't even ask me who I was. The, the, the people that were at the nightclub, the people on the right hand start going, Chompiras, Chompiras. The people on the left start going, Chompiras, Chompiras. The MC decides that the street people that have great applause, and he's going to call those street people back to the stage for the first, second, and first place. And one of those people. 
So the second time that he calls me to the stage, I come into the stage with a friend of mine, and he takes off my hat, and he starts combing my hair, and then he pretends to slap me. <laughs> Which is what Chompiras did on the TV show. And the crowd goes crazy. The DJ starts playing a song. Which was the theme song of that TV show. And the crowd starts dancing to that theme. And everybody's going, Chompiras, Chompiras. They don't even ask. I won first place the night. And I won $500. And the best part is that you also win tonight. I'm not going to give you any money because I'm cheap. I already told you that. But you got something better. You got knowledge. Because before my story, you didn't know about Chumbira, you didn't know about Chespirito. And before my story, before I was invited to this festival, before you heard my stories, you probably heard that immigrants, people like me, we are criminals, and we come to this country to force our language, to force our tradition on you. But now you know that that's not true. We come to this country, we learn your traditions, we learn your language, and we take your traditions and we put our own spices on them. We make them ours. We make them better. And it's in that, exactly that, the contributions of immigrants from all over the world that have truly made this country great. Thank you. Nestor is brought to our festival by the Georgia Council for the Arts and a generous gift from the papa and grandmother of this festival, Tom and Angela Wilkerson. Mm. I fell in love with our next storyteller's fairy tales. I've watched Megan Hicks for years, and she's one of the best fairy tale and folklore tellers I have ever seen. She also has this wonderful kindness and energy to her that sort of embodies the fairy godmother aesthetic. And so last night when she told the grandmother groundhog, fairy grandmother groundhog story, and she wrote down, she actually said, bippity boppity boo, oh, don't cross that one off the bucket list. I finally heard her say it. So <laughs> Megan is brought to our festival by a grant from the Georgia Council for the Arts, a grant from the Nora Roberts Foundation, and a generous gift from my family. Everyone, Megan Hicks. <clears throat> you fix this for me. <laughs> oh, you all are astonishing. This festival is wonderful. Everyone here, the hospitality is something I'll take home with me that will warm me for a good long time. Thank you all so much, so much. Mm. Um, I used to hate fables, Aesop's fables especially, because there was always a moral at the end, and it, they just kind of seemed a little preachy. It's like, just tell me the story, don't tell me what the moral is, let me figure that out myself. But there's one that I really like, and I think it's very timely for these times, and I used to tell it a lot when I had school groups, uh, fifth grade and up. I would tell this fable that I just love and I think it teaches such a good lesson. And it's about a man who was one day walking across a meadow, minding his own business, and he heard something in the ground going psst, psst. He looked around, psst. Hey, buddy, buddy, look down, down here, down, down. He looked around, he didn't see anything talking. Down at your feet, down at your feet. He looked down at his feet and, oh, there was a snake, there was a snake trapped under a rock with his head sticking out, and the snake said, buddy, 
I've been trapped under this rock all day long. The sun is baking me. I haven't had anything to drink or eat. I'm going to die if you don't save me. Come on. Do a pal a favor. Lift the rock and let me out, okay? Okay? The guy says, no. No. I know what kind of snake you are. You're one of those treacherous, venomous little snakes that one drop of your venom and I'm dead. Oh, man. Give me some credit, would you? Do you think I would do that to the guy that saved my life? He said, you promise? Promise. All right. So the guy bent down, he lifted the rock, put it to the side, and before he could stand up again, that snake had coiled itself around his leg and bared its fangs to bite. The guy said, wait a minute, you promised you wouldn't hurt me. The snake says, yeah, I did. And I lied. <laughs> he said, don't look so shocked. You told me, you told me at the get-go, you knew who you were dealing with, that I am treacherous, that I am venomous. Buddy, you should have known better. Now, I am not going to leave impressionable children with that ending to that fable. I sat with that for a while, wishing I could share it, and then finally I found a solution. Over in Italy, there is an ending to this story, and this is how the Italians finish this story. Well, the man begged and pleaded and begged and pleaded. Finally, the snake said, you are so pathetic. All right, let's make it a game, okay? The next three creatures that come through this meadow we will ask them what they think of you. If one of them thinks that you deserve to live, I'll let you go, okay? Ah, <sighs> thank heaven, thought the man. And here comes my salvation right now. There's a dog, my best friend. Oh, yes. Hey, dog, dog, come here, come here, come here, buddy, come here. I said, dog, listen, I need a favor from you. See, I saved the snake's life. He was trapped under that rock. I lifted the rock. He promised he wasn't going to kill me. And now look at this. He's getting ready to bite me unless you tell him I deserve to live. Come on, buddy. Come on. And dog went. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. <laughs> you buy that croc that I am your best friend? He said, man, think about it. I spend all my days running up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill chasing your stupid sheep. And if one of those stupid sheep goes missing, I don't get to come home till I find it. And then when I come home, if you're having a bad day, chances are you're going to yell at me. You might even kick me. When you remember to feed me, I've noticed that you're the one who gets the meat. I'm the one who gets the bone. And then at night, do I get to sleep? Do I get to rest? No, I have to guard your premises. Dog said, man, I am so sick of you. And he said, snake, let him have it. <laughs> Dog went away. Man was feeling kind of shaken. But he had heart again because here comes horse. Here comes horse. Now, horse and I, we work together. I've known horse since he was a foal. We he knows me. He knows me. He says, horse, horse, come here. Please come here. Listen, I need your help, okay? Um, and he explained the situation, and he said, snake is going to bite me and kill me if you don't tell him I'm a good guy and I deserve to live. And horse said, oh, that's rich. <laughs> what are you, man? You are so full of yourself. Think about it. I spend all of my good years grinding your meal, pulling your plow, with you whipping me behind me. When I have a baby, you break my heart. You take that foal away from me before it's even weaned. And after I have given you all of my strength, all of my youth, do you turn me out to pasture and let me die a dignified death? No! You call the knacker and have me turned into dog food and glue. Man, I am so happy to see you in this predicament. Horse said, snake, let him have it. 
Well, man had lost heart now, and the third creature was coming into the forest, and his heart sank because he knew he was doomed, or this third creature. The third creature to come into the meadow was Fox. And he thought, no, if there is ever a creature more treacherous and deceitful than that snake, it's that fox. But it was his last hope. So he said, fox, fox, um, come here, please. Would you um, do us a favor? Listen to my story, OK? See, I was just walking along, minding my own business, and, and, and snake was trapped under a rock here, and he called out to me to lift the rock, save his life. He promised he wasn't going to hurt me. I lifted the rock, and look at this. He's getting ready to bite me and kill me unless you tell him I'm a decent person and I deserve to live. What do you say? Will you help me, please? And Fox said, what? He said, I don't get it, man. This doesn't make sense to me. He said, that is a big rock, but you are a big man. And I can't see how you could possibly be trapped under that rock. Snake said, no, you idiot, I was under the rock. <laughs> you and man were under the rock together? <laughs> that is wrong on so many levels. <laughs> Snake said, no, I was under the rock. Man was walking, I, well, but, but, but. you're confusing me, you're confusing me. I, 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 I can't get it. I can't get it. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. Why don't, you, why don't you show me what happened, OK? Snake said, this is the stupidest creature I have ever met. He said, all right, man, lift the rock. We'll show him how it went down. So man bent down. He lifted the rock up. Snake uncoiled himself and put himself back into that spot. Man wedged the rock back down on him. And when that happened, Fox stood up to his full height. He his whiskers. He dusted himself off. He looked at the man. He said, sir, you better get out of here right now because if he does escape again, he's not going to show you mercy. Man skedaddled out of there. Snake looked up indignant. He said, you, 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 treacherous. You just, uh, 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 what, what's the matter? What's the matter? Don't be pathetic, said the fox. You knew when I walked into the meadow who you were dealing with. Buddy, you should have known better. <laughs> One more time for Megan Hicks, please. Our last storyteller of the evening, Michael Reno Harrell, is one of my favorites to listen to because you always come away from one of his stories smarter. He shares so much wisdom, like the wisdom of knowing that you should save pieces of string too short to use, or that dirty dishes are the most patient things in the world. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you can take home and use right away. Michael is brought to us by a grant from the Georgia Council for the Arts, another grant from the South Arts Foundation, and a generous gift from Gail and Greg Boots, who had to go home, so they're watching.
these old men up there trying to outlaw each other. Now, what would happen was when, a, when one of those dogs would strike a fox scent, he'd go like that, and then they were off and running. And every dog had a different voice, just like, you know, you know how dogs are. They all sound different. I mean, your dog don't sound like your neighbor's dog, probably. They all got different voices, so they'd be maybe seven, twelve, just like that guy at Santa Anita can call a thoroughbred rush, you know. And again, that's where I learned to lie. So they call that once the dogs start barking, those old boys call that the music of the fox race. And the first time I ever heard that music, I was probably about six years old. Stover said, come on, boy, it's time for you to learn. I said, what am I going to learn? He said, you're going to learn to stretch the truth. I couldn't wait. So the first time we went, we went to a mountain that called Old Piney up there in Buncombe County. And it was me and Tom and Stover and, and uh, Tom Harmon and Sam Burton. So we got up there on top of the mountain. Them old boys built the fire and put the coffee pots on and started telling tales on each other. And I was just sitting there like, I thought it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever heard. Well, this went on for, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes. And then down the hill somewhere we heard, oh, and here they went, and the line stopped, and those old men just, it was like the angels were singing. They were just like, And I'm sitting there watching these old men and going, what's wrong with them? And Sam Burton looked down at me and he said, son, hey, you like that music? And I said, Sam, I can't hear the music for your dogs barking. <laughs> but it turned out to be my favorite song in the world. Uh, those old men treated me like I was somebody. Now Stover, Stover at the end of the night would always say, now son, we gotta get back, to, gotta get you back to your Aunt Asley's house. He said, we gotta, gotta get ready and go to church. He said, you know, we've gotta thank the Lord for this wonderful time we've had out here in these beautiful mountains tonight. He said, now get in and get you a little sleep, and get your bath and get your tie on and we'll, I'll pick you up and we'll go up to the Snow Hill Methodist. Now all my family were Methodists. My great grandfather, uh, Snow Hill Methodist Church up there. My great grandfather donated the lumber for it in 1886. My mother's asleep behind it in the night, and so was Stover and all all my relatives, pretty much. Anyway, so I'd go home, and get a little sleep, and get my bath, and get my Sunday school shirt and tie on. And Mom and them would go on to church because they knew Stover was going to come get me. Well, Stover, he didn't get any sleep. He went home and doctored his dogs and all that and made sure they were fed and then fed the chickens and all that stuff he had to do. Got his coffee going, had that. And then he'd get in that old international truck and come up and park in front of my Aunt Asley's house and sit out there and blow the horn and I'd come running out, climb in there with him and we'd go off to Snow Hill Methodist. Now this particular this particular Sunday was in June. Now, hunting season was about over by then. You know, it was getting too hot to run your dogs up here. But it was a, it was a pretty, pretty night, and Sam said, let's do one more hunt before the season's over. So we had. We'd had a good night. Well, me and Stover got up there to the church, and he parked in his parking place. Don't ever park there. He was the oldest member of the congregation. Well, it was getting sun up by church time. We'd skipped Sunday school, of course. And uh, it was getting pretty warm. So when we walked in the church in the vestibule there, there was a cardboard box with funeral home fans from Gross Funeral Home over in Asheville. And you had your choice. You could get praying hands or Jesus in the garden, you know. And I always got praying hands. And so anyway, we went in third pew down on the right side Right next to the aisle, that was the Stover Mason seat right there at this, beside this aisle. Don't ever sit there. 
Well, number one, you wouldn't want to sit there because his old skinny butt had worn two grooves in it over 80 years, and your butt wouldn't fit in it anyway. So we got in there and sit down. Had the windows open. Choir was singing. They were going at it. And we were sitting there, everybody running them fans. Just Stover was like, boy, the choir sounds pretty good today, don't they? Yeah. Oh, listen to them. Oh, I love that old hymn right there. Oh, yeah. We was working them fans. He said, boy, I love this old church. Such a part of my life. Yeah, I said, yeah, you're the oldest member. He said, yeah, I know. I've outlived a bunch of them. Lord, yeah. He said, you know, you only get here about every other weekend. He said, you know, Last week, the preacher called on me to, to give the, the, the benediction prayer and close the service. I said, I know you've done that a lot. He said, yeah, me and the Lord talk a lot. I said, I think, I think they all like the way you pray. He said, well, like I say, me and the Lord's on speaking terms pretty good. He said, you know, but last, year, last week you wasn't here. He said, I'm getting kind of hard of hearing. He said, you know... Last week when he called on me, I couldn't tell if he was looking at me or somebody back behind me. I wasn't real sure he was a calling on me. He said, I'll tell you what you do, boy. He said, if he calls on me, you just give me a little nudge and I'll know for sure he's looking at me. I said, all right. So we were sitting there running them fans. And then the preacher got up and he got to going pretty good. Stowers was like, listen to this. Amen. <laughs> Tell it, brother. <laughs> if I didn't know better, I'd think he was a Baptist. Listen to this. <laughs> He'd give them what for him. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's sitting there running that fan, and the preacher got to going pretty good. And it got a little warmer in there and a little warmer in the store. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Amen. <laughs> that old fan went down pretty soon. Head went down. And I looked over at him and I thought, he ain't had no sleep all night. Good Lord. I'll just let him sleep there. If anybody sees him, they'll think he's just praying silently. <laughs> and then that old head started going back. And I looked around, everybody was starting to look at him, and I thought, oh, Lord. Everybody's going, mm, he'll be so embarrassed. And I went, it's over. And he jumped up and ended the service right there. <laughs> Spinning yarns and listening to the songs of hounds And I've spent a lot of time around tall buildings And I don't mind telling you what I have done I've found that wood smoke and laughter at a good joke In the company of legendary liars and a story well recited by a fire has delighted both young and old since we discovered fire. He 
It was me and Sam and Stover and Tom Harmon Round the fire with those old men when I was a kid And their stories on the wind like leaves of autumn Then Stover said, son, you tell us a story Cause I knew that wood smoke and laughter a good joke In the company of legendary liars And a story well recited by a fire has delighted Both young and old since we discovered fire So oh, some evening when the moon is big and shining You don't need foxhounds All you need's a kid Build a fire if it's only in the backyard And then tell stories and you'll both be glad you did You'll find with wood smoke and laughter at a good joke you too can be a legendary liar Because a story well recited by a fire Has delighted both young and old Since we discovered fire Anybody got a match? Y'all be careful going home We'll see you somewhere Thank you so much race off one more time for all of our gifted storytellers <clears throat> mm -hmm. Lynn and Ann and Megan and Nestor and Michael also one more time for Cameron for carrying what she did <laughs> The marketplace will remain open for just a few more minutes. Nestor has said he does not want to take any of his stuff home. So go visit that. But before we close it out, I want to welcome our founders, Dr. Amanda Lawrence and Dr. Ruth Looper. This moment is a dream come true for me because my lovely husband has just given me the last word. <laughs> yeah. Now, as we close, I just want to say a few words to circle back to the beginning. When a small group of people said, yes, we can, and yes, we should, and yes, we will. When we talked about what we wanted this festival to be and why we wanted this festival to be, we came up with the festival's official motto, claim your voice. We wanted to showcase a diverse array of voices to encourage and empower everyone, whoever you are, to own your voice, own your story, and tell it in your way. Now that's our official motto. Thank you. <laughs> Our unofficial motto is joy to the people. And we hope that whether you are watching online or you are here with us tonight, that you have felt the love and the joy in this space and that we have held it for each other. So this festival started out as the dream of a few very naively hopeful people. <laughs> Crazy people. Crazy, okay, I, you're, yeah. <laughs> I love your bluntness. <laughs> crazy people. Um, it started out as the dream of a few naively hopeful crazy people. And thanks to all of you who, who are, as Michael said this afternoon, the ones who shine the light. This festival has blossomed over the past 10 years. So we just want to say thank you 
for dreaming that dream along with us. And we hope to see you next year. Thank you. Do you want to say anything?